Hi everybody, my name is Evan Phoenix. I'm a principal engineer here at HashiCorp. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the waypoint runners. Like what are they, why do they have them within the overall waypoint architecture? And what really makes them interesting about ways that we're using them and ways that we're gonna be using them even, even a more inter in a more interesting way in 0 0.5. But first, let's do a little quick intro, what is waypoint? There's been a, f uh, a few presentations on this before, so I'm gonna do this fairly briefly. Waypoint is the idea of how do you take what you have in your code base, whatever language it is, and how do you get it to your deployment platform in a way that makes sense for how you want to be using it. Specifically, within Waypoint, there are a few different phases that we break up this work into. Normally, there is the you want to request a build, and that the build happens as a specific phase. That build generates some artifact that is going to get used by the build phase, and then that or it's going to get used by the deploy phase, excuse me, and that deploy phase then gives a deployment over to the release phase. And this is sort of the broad strokes of what the workflow looks like within Waypoint. If we look at the architecture of these phases, though, what we see is that it's a little bit more nuanced in that what you actually have is you have a build and you have a build phase, but really you're using, these phases are ways of instrumenting plugins that are specific you know, specific build plugins, specific deploy plugins, specific release plugins, right? And what's interesting is if we look at those plugins even more closely, what we find is that those plugins are very environmental, right? So within the plugin, you're gonna have different SDKs to access the different services, Docker, Kubernetes, Nomad, AWS, whatever it might be. Those are gonna be talking out over a network, probably, to some API, but they're also probably gonna be reading the disk to do different things, to do look at files, uh, to read config configuration from any number of different places. So because they're so environmental, we realized pretty early on that we needed a way of making sure that those plugins could really run in sort of varied, varied ways. So, what we introduced pretty early on in Waypoint is the idea of having a job system, of having a way of saying, I need to execute this thing and actually having the way in which it executes be sort of abstract, right? So let's drill down a little bit here. So for each one of these phases, we have effectively what something that looks like this, where you get your client, it's gonna say, hey, I need to do a build. It's gonna tell the server, hey, a build needs to happen. That server is gonna create a job. That job's gonna get picked up by the runner and that the runner is going to then go off and invoke a plugin to go off and do something. Let's look at what that looks like specifically, right? So you've got, all right, there'll be a cut here. We'll re restart this slide. So for each phase, we've got something that looks effectively something like this, right? You've got your client. Your client's gonna, gonna have something it needs to get done. It's gonna say, go from the client. It's gonna go up to the server. Hey, I need to go do a build. That, that information is gonna make its way over to the runner. Hey, runner, you need to go do a build. And that information about what actually needs to happen is gonna get propagated then down into the actual plugin. Let's drill down now a little bit more to what actually happens. What's the actual architecture for some of these things a little bit more closely to reality, right? In reality, we have something that looks a little bit more like this, right? Where we have the, we have that request and we've actually, what we have, if we separated out the server and the runner into two different pieces, and in fact, what, rather than the server actually giving a job to a runner directly, like connecting to the runner, it's actually the inverse. The runner connects back to the server and then says, hey, give me any jobs. Could you, could you hand out any jobs? So specifically, let's look at that again, like we did before. So you've got your request to go off and, and do the work, right? It's gonna go up to the server. And now the runner is gonna have been just waiting for any job information. And the server is then gonna return to that waiting runner. Hey, here's some information. And again, we've sort of showed the internet here because that's really what the design is, that the server and the runner can be very disconnected from each other. The run server needs to be available to be connected to, but it could be anywhere. And then that job can come down and get uh, pulled by the, again, it's been pulled by the runner, and now it's gonna get handed off to the plugins again. So that's, that's, that's super nice. But one thing that we've done here is this works very well, 
But we've still said that, again, those plugins are very environmental. So in this particular instance, those plugins are going to need, that, that runner that's invoking those plugins is going to need to be in this, the, whatever specific context that the runner needs to be in in order to access the APIs and what have you. And so there's a lot of limitations in how that functions right now, um, because you need to make sure that the runners, that those, those environments have everything that they need. And so for 0 0.5, what we're doing is we're introducing a brand new feature called on-demand runners. And uh, we think that this is probably gonna be the main way that people interact with the, the system in the future. Um, that's a little bit to be determined, but it's gonna really unlock a lot of interesting functionality um, that is hard for the runner system to do today. So let's look at on-demand runners in a very specific case. So now you see we've, we have sort of what looks similar, but now we've also said that there's this extra platform bit, right? So let's, let's walk through what actually is gonna happen now when we, uh, we've added this on-demand uh, runner concept. So again, we have our request. Our request, request goes to the client, hey, I need to do a build, right? The is processed by the server says, hey, this is, hey server, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go to need to do a build. Now, what the server does is it's aware that the on-demand runners exist. And so it's it's actually at this point that it says, you know what, I actually want this to happen with an on-demand runner. So it spawns its own job, a special job that it actually passes through to our one and only what we call the static runner. And that job basically says, go start a new runner, right? So that runner is now passed through, it's gonna get passed over to the platform, and then it's actually gonna go launch another, uh, uh, you know, in this case, this shows a few, but it could be any number of different runners. For this, it's gonna be one runner for this particular new job. And now that that new runner has started, we actually, that new runner is now actually gonna get passed again through the internet or through however, down to it, right? So now what we've done is we basically allow those runners to be launched in a, in a platform. One really crucial thing that this unlocks is scalability as well. Before, with those static runners, you had to decide, that an operator had to decide, hey, how many of these different runners should I run? And that number, however that, whatever that number was, sort of determined the capacity of your waypoint system, right? If you didn't have enough runners, you could only get a certain number of jobs before you basically ran out of compute, right? This on-demand runner concept allows us to spin up runners to soak up the capacity of whatever platform it might be with uh, pretty transparently without having to uh, have the operators go and reconfigure uh, different numbers of static runners. One of the other things that it does is it uh, unlocks some functionality that is actually really hard for a lot of platforms to realize, and that's how do you do builds, specifically how do you do builds, right? So let's look at how builds sort of happen today. In a traditional sort of build context, right? You've got your runner, you've got a plugin. Let's say that we're gonna be building a Docker container in this example, right? And then you've got, so you've got Docker also, and then you've got the C group APIs. Those are the, those are the low level APIs that Linux exposes this, that Docker actually instruments in order to go start containers and be able to do builds, right? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a, a request as it comes through, right? So that request, hey, I wanna do a build, it's gonna come through to the runner. It's gonna get transferred over to the plugin to say, hey, I need to do a build. Well, it's, it's actually at this point that the runner has to decide, well, I need to translate this into something that is workable by Docker, right? So it's gonna transfer it into, in this case, we're gonna represent that with a chili pepper, right? So it's gonna make, hey, I need to do this sort of work, right? And that's gonna pass over to the Docker, over to Docker. And Docker is gonna then take that work and translate it basically into C group work. That's a big, the availability of C groups to do all the things is something that is not really well available in, um, on different runner platforms. For instance, um, some Kubernetes uh, instances have it available, but some don't, right? And so that becomes a really spicy way for us to operate. And actually it's been a real source of problem for Waypoint users today when you're doing um, different kinds of deploys that where the build ha is gonna ha be happening on the runner side, um, which uh, you're on a runner that is happening in the cloud, right? You'd have to have these, uh, pods be specially configured with all the right permissions and that kind of thing. And we really wanted to be able to use the on-demand runners to make this scenario much easier. So what we've done is we've stripped out for 0.5 the, the need for that C group 
and as well as for the Docker context. So now what we do in the on-demand runner context, we have something that looks more like this, right? You're gonna get your request, it's gonna to go to the, to the runner, to the plugin, and then it's gonna get turned into something that's much more palatable. In this case, we're gonna say a waffle. And then we're gonna have the plugin actually talk directly to Linux to call processes, to write files, to actually build an image or do the, the image actual building directly on, on just regular old bare Linux APIs. Post six APIs rather than using C groups, and that functionality is available basically everywhere, right? Because that's the same functionality the runner is using to just run onto itself. Now, you might ask yourself, uh, why does that work though? Like, why aren't, aren't, aren't you losing a lot by not having the Docker and the C groups and stuff in there? Well, you would lose a lot until you realize that this whole setup is really inside another one, and let's zoom out for a second. What we see is it really looks like this. This is really the, what you see is now we're actually inside the C group or inside whatever that isolation context is. So we're not actually getting rid of that security boundary. We're actually just operating in within it the entire time instead of spawning a new security boundary as sort of part of the plugin uh, running. Right. So that gives us the knowledge that like, hey, this is not going to escape and that these builds are going to be safe because that work is actually happening just inside that isolation group already. Let's look at what it looks like in a specific context. In this case, we're going to look at what it looks like for Kubernetes. So uh, this whole thing for Kubernetes, rather. So we've got our request. Our request is going to come in, go to the client. It's going to go on to the server and we're going to spawn a job that's our waffle in this case that's going to get passed off to our runner and again that runner is run actually just running inside the kubernetes cluster it's running as a pod inside the inside that kubernetes cluster it's a static runner and it's responsible for basically taking that request to start tasks and it's then just going to talk right back to the kubernetes api that of the cluster that it is within and then what we're going to do is we're going to get a new runner that's going to get spawned. That request is now going to flow from the server down to that brand new runner and then down through from the runner to the plugin. And now we've basically built that image in that context. Well, now all of my examples so far have, have shown this server client relationship. Let's look at a more the dare I say modern way that people are deploying things. And that's with a GitOps style. Let's look at what it actually looks like in the GitOps style. Well, first of all, let's get rid of that client. We don't need that anymore, right? So in the GitOps style, we've got these things that are happening on the Git server. You've got your, your, your code is being pushed and the server is actually polling and figuring out if there's new code and if it needs to do new actions. And this is all configured, this all works right now. This is all configured with project polling inside Waypoint. Right. So the first thing we do is we need to spin that machinery. So let's let's go ahead and spin that machinery up. And after it's spun, the server is going to say, hey, OK, I detected that there is new code. I need to go do a build. So it's going to go ahead and spawn that new build object. And it's going to say, oh, OK, I need to actually do this work. No problem. So it's going to do the same thing we did before. It's going to spawn up a job to go to go tell the runner in the pod to tell Kubernetes to begin build to build up an on-demand runner, at which point that on-demand runner is going to take the original job that was generated from the get stuff into the runner, into the build. The build is going to happen and that build is going to from there generate an actual image. And in this case, also, the because our build and our registry plugins are sort of tightly coupled, the, that built image is going to immediately get taken off and sent off to an OCI registry. So that's a little bit of how Waypoint runners work, why we build them. They're really to unlock all this really interesting functionality about how to decouple the work that needs to get done in order to perform a deployment, your work, your, we talk a lot about build, but the same is true for deployment and release as well. And how it allows this functionality allows us the, uh, the ability to give operators lots of flexibility and functionality to make this work the way that they needed to work uh, in order to get their software deployed. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.